All right, now we are joined by Brock Howell, Representative of the Royal Frame, Representative Joe Fitzgibbon, who are going to tell us why we should vote yes on Sound Transit 3. So go ahead uh, with up to five minutes to introduce why we should vote yes. Um, hi, my name is Brock Howell. I'm the Deputy Campaign Manager for the Mass Transit for Now campaign. Uh, how many of you were stuck in traffic sometime this week? <laughs> Most people. If not, you're probably on a bike or something like that. Um, it's, everybody experiences it in the region. We know this region is one of the, the most congested regions that uh, we have. And there is uh, about a million people moving here um, over the next uh, 25 million years. Um, so we need to address this issue and provide an option for people to avoid that issue. With SC3, we have a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, we failed to pass forward for us in 1968-1970, which would have built out this light rail system or a rail system connecting to Coleman to Everett. And for the first time, we finally have the opportunity to have that on the ballot of being able to connect this region and get us out of traffic. Um, the, there are some big wins for here in Ballard with the Ballard to downtown uh, light rail, which will connect into the Tacoma uh, line eventually. Um, over the course of the making of the SC3 package, we were able to expedite the, con the construction of that project and hope that it can be accelerated even more, but the commitment is what it is today. Um, in addition, there is a, a proposal to study um, create a separated line from Ballard to UW and then across Lake Washington, um, which follows closely the SDOT's own project, which is a rapid ride project that will be implemented more quickly. Um, and so we can look forward potentially to another project in the future. But in the big picture, this is about making sure that people get around this region. Um, for there's um, every major employer in the region will be connected by a flight rail, whether it's the uh, software giants of Microsoft and Amazon and Expedia, um, or the engineering for, or the sorry the aerospace uh, jobs of Boeing, uh, up in Painfield, at Boeing Field, um, and in Winton Kent through the bus rapid transit connections in South Kent. Um, in addition, so there's about 93% of the region's jobs when this is done are going to be connected by this mass transit. Um, and over 80% of people uh, will be within two and a half miles of the light rail system, making it uh, a truly a, co a connected region. This is also about making sure that we're living up to some of the other values we have. Uh, we believe in addressing global warming. This is the one measure on the ballot this year that every, there's unanimous consent that we should keep uh, passing it in order to uh, reduce global warming pollution. Um, from our transportation sector. Transportation is the number one uh, pollutant for us in this, re uh, in this uh, region, um, and so we must address it, and rail is a big part. Obviously, we are really concerned about affordability of our community. Um, the number one uh, factor in whether someone can move up the economic ladder is transportation. It's a number two cost for a household, um, it provides access to education, it provides access to jobs. Um, so all of the natural studies say we need to make sure that we have reliable, affordable transportation that we provide to more people. By connecting more than 80% of the people in this region and 93% of the jobs, we will be provided that opportunity for more people to, uh, to move up the economic ladder. Um, and so with that, you know, we have this it's been since 1970 since we've had this opportunity. We can talk about all the other things that we failed to do along the way, which I'm sure will come up regarding like taxes or whatever else. Um, but we finally have this on the ballot of where we can connect our region, including making sure that uh, this district is connected to the system. And so with that, we uh, strongly hope for your endorsement to follow that. Of many other LDs around the, uh, the region, um, and many of our Democratic leaders around the region as well, uh, like Joan and Philip. So with that, thank you, and happy to take questions. Great. So now we'll ask follow-up questions. We'll start with Michael. Um, I think that the light rail expansion gets a lot of the um, uh, 
coverage because it's kind of the exciting thing and probably the thing that I'm most excited about. But could you talk a little bit more about the bus route transit and especially the like improvements to the sounder? What are, what are, what are those actually? Yeah, so there's um, three other big improvement or three other improvements to other forms of transit in the region. You highlighted some. Um, there are three bus rapid transit, four bus rapid transit projects uh, that uh, I think we should pay attention to. The, the big ones, which are sound transit only projects, uh, is helping uh, kind of the 405 corridor of connecting Linwood to Bothell to, um, to Bellevue to Renton and then back to Burien, uh, which I'm sure Joe will enjoy and to be able to have quick access to Bellevue. Yes. Um, via 405. Uh, the, the other is connecting across the north end of Lake Washington from the 145th station, which uh, straddle is going to be now 148th, I think, but uh, it basically straddles Seattle and Snow and Shoreline, um, and then connects from SR 522 over to Bothell. Um, and so that, uh, the community there really advocated very strongly for that and has become part of that. The two others are partnership projects. Um, one is with SDOT uh, to uh, do a rapid ride on Madison on Capitol Hill, and the other is with Pierce Transit on Pacific Avenue. Um, and that funding is still being uh, sorted out to make sure that's a full project down uh, in Pierce Transit, but it's a huge win for, for Pierce. Sounder gets uh, increased service um, on the south line and in, and in addition extension uh, to all the way to DuPont. And then in the interim of us getting light rail uh, service and the system being built out, the ST Express buses across the system also get uh, increased service. Um, so that's the third piece. Sarah and then Evan will talk. Matt, can you talk a little bit about the funding sources and, uh, for specifically Prop 1 and whether that would influence the legislative funding and other priorities such as uh, our constitutional mandate and priorities for basic education? And then I have one more question, and that was just based on I think the opponents um, talked about you know, sound transit spending almost $1 million on a party, and they, they kind of were, I think, um, inclin their inclination was to say that. Um, and I think, so Joe and I, I think will bring different perspectives on this. Joe, like our other, like the rest of the delegation, the 36 was actually in the legislature during the fight uh, for um, authority for sound transit. I was not. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm coming at this, obviously, as somebody who is a strong opponent of fully funding public education, looking at um, addressing our broader revenue system. And so, I mean, first and foremost, I want to say that sound transit is operating within the authority that was given to it by the legislature. Um, and yes, it relies on property tax and sales tax and motor vehicle excise tax. That is the authority that was given, and uh, Joe can probably speak more to that, that part of it. Um, the legislature, on the other side, is when it comes to education funding, is not limited to property tax and sales tax and motor vehicle excise tax. We have a lot of options that we could explore. We just haven't done that yet. Uh, and the 2017 session is the time, the legislature, we have committed to meet on the clarity obligation in the 2017 session. The state reiterated that commitment through their attorney today in the McCleary hearing before the Supreme Court. So I think what the funding sources that we have here are what we're giving to San Transit to work with, whereas I think the state has a much broader set of tools in the toolbox that we can and should look at. We should look at capital gains tax in the short term. We should look at closing the loopholes. Perhaps the Supreme Court will do it for us as the plaintiff's attorney, Tom Ahern, said today that he thinks one of the potential sanctions is to cancel all 650 tax breaks. That is something on the table. Um, and, you know, we could look at an income tax, something our district supports very strongly. So I just want to set that tone a little bit. Um, I can also speak, I have my own view on the party piece, but I want to flip it to Joe and give him a chance to respond to the funding source question. Sure, what's the and, and I think this is a big enough question. If yes. we add, add another two minutes. It was like a three-part question. Yeah, go ahead. And Thank you. Yeah. Um, so 
the, the, the tax sources in uh, the South Kansas measure are property tax, sales tax, and motor vehicle excise tax. And those are sort of the classic tools that have been used for building transportation infrastructure in our region, funding, um, and that in large part went away um, you know, due to an IMO initiative, but um, the one part of it that's remained has, has been dedicated to sound transit construction. The sales tax is super aggressive, we all hate it, but that is how we fund both buses and rail construction in our region. And then the property tax, which is not, it's not the first time property tax has been used for a transportation measure. We have King County Metro receives money from a property tax levy as the King County Ferry District and other transportation sources. I don't put the onus on a local agency to lead the way on tax reform in the state. That's the legislature's job, and that's something that we haven't done yet, but which the McCleary decision gives us a huge amount of pressure to do. Um, I consider that a, a feature, not a bug, of the sound transit plan. You know, it, it uses the property tax and forces the legislature to get more creative, forces us to look at closing on productive tax loopholes or a capital gains tax or some kind of revenue from carbon pollution. That's a good thing. If we are already conceding that we're going to be using, you know, a property tax increase, particularly going to be a steeper property tax increase in Seattle than in the, the rural parts of the state, as our McCleary solution, I consider us to have already ceded that ground to Republicans. So I think that we should pass this measure and then use that as one more reason to go into the 2017 session and push for a smarter tax structure. On the part, you want to well, I'll just say really quickly on the party. I mean, I, I, I don't know the whole million bucks, so maybe Brock, you can speak to it. I will just say, as a marketing and communications person by trade, you do need to promote these things when they happen. Uh, I think we saw an 83% spike in ridership uh, after the, the UW station opened. Um, so I would say money well spent um, to achieve exactly what we were looking for. Brock, you want to add anything to that? I think that's well put. So uh, a large part of that was on security, not even marketing. So yeah. um, it was a much smaller piece just on our community. It was a huge moment for our city. You know, huge, uh, opening up the light up and connecting our downtown with our densest neighborhood with our university. That's a moment of civic pride. And, you know, and, and on the cool. scale of what Sound Transit spends to build infrastructure, I'm okay with it. And the week, what was it, a couple weeks after the 520 Bridge mm -hmm. Festival, yeah. which I don't know how much they spent, <laughs> but if we're going to have a big celebration <laughs> for a road, I think we can have a big celebration for a all right, so Evan, and then Summer, and then Joseph. Um, could you speak a little to the, I heard the concern expressed about uh, how, like, specifically, West Seattle and Ballard light rail lines, in terms of um, sort of the security that voters could feel that both of those lines are, in fact, going to get built, and that the different uh, sort of neighborhoods of Seattle won't end up having to fight each other for funding to make sure that those get in. I understand that there's a plan in place, but I just wonder how um, how strongly tied the funding source is to the plan and, mm -hmm. and the measure, and whether you can speak to that a little bit. We have to fight each other. Yeah. Those are our two districts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty clear that, you know, Ballard to West Seattle is the most important deliverable for Seattle in the plan. Um, and I think the, the makeup of the South Transit Board shows you that, you know, you have very strong representation Northwest part of the city and from the southwest part of the city. If there was a massive economic contraction like there was in 2009 and the board had to prioritize, those are the last two things that would come off the list. Um, there, so, in and particularly because we have, thanks to Rob and Kenna, sub area equity. So, all of the, of the five sound fans and sub areas, the money collected there is spent in that region. Um, we had a big contraction in South King County in 2009, and the, the board had to postpone a number of projects in the South King sub area because there's not that much tax revenue there compared to what there is in East King or in Seattle. Um, that was painful, but the good news is that as the economy's recovered, they've restored those projects and actually accelerated some of them. The Angle Lake Station and SeaTac was opening in a week and a half. That was originally going to be completed in 2020, and it's going to be completed wow. next week. Um, so. You know, the, the ballot measure doesn't bind the board to construct things at this, on this timeline, because that would be fiscally irresponsible. But, I can tell you, I'm not taking out ballot or West Seattle. <laughs> those, are not, those are the number one and number two projects uh, for the core of our region, and, um, and I, it would be fiscally irresponsible, I think, to bind an agency to a timeline, um, not knowing what the economy is going to be like 15 years from now, but those projects are not.
summer than Joseph? So any vote it seems like you know it's such a binary choice. But this one feels particularly so. Like if we don't do this, then we don't get. I mean, if we are, we're not going to vote for nice things, then we're not going to have nice things. It's definitely how it feels to me. I grew up in Oregon, and I remember growing up, everybody said, "Oh, the maps is going to take so long to be built out," and it, you know, it's built out, and it's amazing, and it's impressive and inspiring and I see that that's what's happening here. Can you also talk to what if this fails? Like what does that mean? Like what's the what's the flip side? Because to me it, it seems like that's unthinkable. I mean I, just my humble opinion, I mean we are growing so rapidly and congestion is really bad. Right, and it's really bad. It is. It's nice that we're growing so fast, and that we are drawing in so many incredible economic engines. If this fails, I mean, I can't speak for them, but you got to think that future employers are going to think really long and hard before they cite those companies here. Um, if we don't have a transportation structure, it's. I mean, I think we're all feeling it. I know I hear it almost every day when I'm out in the community. How unaffordable this community has gotten. How hard it is to get to work. I just, I can't imagine the, the growth and the economic growth is going to continue at the rate if we don't have the money. Hey, I think the other thing to think about is it only gets more expensive as we go, right? Um, it's only going to be longer out there until we can have the transportation system to look if it goes down. Um, and so if we are to, to lose uh, this year, we're looking at a really long time before we're going to have transit service and we're going to have uh, an inflated cost compared to what it is today. And so it is important that we act today. Um, we would only likely come back uh, you know, every four years, maybe every eight years. You know, the last time we did was in 2008 because it was a presidential election. Um, we're time. It's been this year, 2016, has been looked at for a really long time for SD3 because it's the eight year presidential cycle. Um, so it could be a while before it comes back. And that would be a bad thing for, for congestion, for jobs, for how much it costs, for what we get drunk. And I'll just say the real painful thing about that, um, when, you know, we passed a transportation package in 2015 that was $15 billion for new highways and expanded highways and $15 billion in taxing authority for sound transit to build a great transit system in our region. Um, you know, for those of us who want to build a multimodal transportation infrastructure, if we vote this down, we've said, they're still getting the 15 billion for highways. Those highways are still going to get bigger and expanded around the state. But meanwhile, we missed this huge opportunity to have transit. It's all that political leverage gone. Joseph. So, two parts, not related. So the first, first question: um, What have we learned, and and how are you implementing this in the current campaign from the last time it failed in 1970? And then also, could you, I know the political landscape is probably pretty different as well, but <laughs> the, the second part too, can you address um, building out the spine argument? Yeah. I, I'll do my best. You can add in. Um, so in 70, it was a super majority vote. Um, that is one lesson, don't have super majority votes. <laughs> <laughs> Second piece is um, show that it works, um, and so having some new pass in the late 90s, um, getting SC2 in 2008 are part of being able to uh, prove to the public that this is going to be successful. So starting incrementally, and I think that's another lesson. That's not something that myself as a campaigner learned, but it's something that the agency and those in the broader community have learned and, and implemented. Um, I think the spine is, uh, you know, it is part of our regional narrative of who we are, and I think that is a critical part of continuing to push that. As a Seattleite, I sometimes like to think, oh, I can do so much with uh, sidewalk improvements or, you know, just hyper-local improving things. But we are in this together. Um, we are collecting taxes together. It is important that each part of our region um, connects to the, to the mass transit system. I feel like South Trans done a, I mean, they've had a hard job to balance all the competing interests of the different communities. And I remember you know, in a car with Jim Robinson and comparing when Everett's getting their light rail versus when Ballard's getting it. And 
I think they had a tough task, um, and they balanced it pretty well. I think in Ballard, we had very specific requests. Um, we had a huge turnout in public um, public feedback at the Ballard High School hearing. We asked to have some years shaved off of the arrival time. We asked for grade separated rail. Um, we didn't get everything we wanted, but we got those two things. And I think that that's something that we need to think about. The other thing too is, you know, we're talking about something that is are really 20 years out, and we're not just thinking about the, our people that live in our district today, but the people that frankly can't afford, won't be able to afford to live here 20 years from now, because that is the, the trajectory that we are on. And so building out to other communities outside of Seattle right. is gonna allow those folks to still be able to get to their jobs. That's an, if that issue of, of economic equity mm -hmm. is actually, for me, one of the most personal reasons that I'm supporting Sound Trend, that people need to get to work. Uh, this is an agency that covers half the state's voters, and you know, if this was a Seattle-only vote, then I would say let's build the best rail system in Seattle possible. But I'm not ask, I don't want to ask people in Mill Creek and in Lakewood um, to pay for a Seattle Transit network, and if they don't feel like they're getting something in return, you know, there's it, we need to build something for the whole region, even that the, the best stuff that we're building is here in Seattle. You know, there needs to be something in Everett so that those people who are going to be paying their taxes too feel like it's worth it. So we're about out of time. If you guys want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement. Thanks, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We had discussed ahead of time if there were additional questions. Yeah. We forego right. our closing statement, so we're happy to field additional questions. We can chat off camera if we want, but um, thank you all for coming.